Welcome, everyone. This is on, yeah. Good afternoon, and welcome to the New America Foundation. My name is Patrick Doherty. I'm the Deputy Director of the American Strategy Program here at New America, as well as the Director of the U.S. Cuba Policy Initiative. Um, today's talk is entitled Bacardi and the Long Fight for Cuba, which also happens to be the title of Tom Jelton's uh, latest book. Um, eminently readable as well. I recommend it to you all, and there's copies out front. Um, and we're extraordinarily pleased to have Tom Jelton here uh, to talk about the book and what he learned about Cuba and the process of it. Um, before I introduce Tom, though, what I want to do is just set the stage a little bit um, for this talk. Um, you know, with the arrival of the Obama administration in Washington and the handing of power from Fidel to Raul Castro in, in Havana, we have come to a moment when the 50-year-old policy uh, towards Cuba is poised for some kind of change. Uh, already subtle changes are happening on both sides of the Florida Straits. President Obama announced his intention to allow unrestricted Cuban-American family travel and remittances, and his administration has taken a number of de-escalatory steps, such as launching talks on migration and mail service, publicly revealing a decade of joint military disaster response exercises at Guantanamo Bay, um, and shutting down the notorious electronic ticker at the U.S. intersection in Havana. On the Cuban side, a severe economic crisis made worse by four devastating hurricanes last year, along with the elevation of the seemingly more pragmatic Raul Castro, has meant an opening for more free market policies in salaries, agriculture, transportation, and as Tom describes in the book, the production and marketing of rum. Further, Congress is considering legislation to repeal laws that ban all Americans uh, from traveling to Cuba without a license from Washington. Indeed, New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson, former leader of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, uh, just returned from the island this week on a trade mission and declared his belief that all Americans should be allowed to travel. Tom's story, however, is about the one family uh, that did more than most any other family to get both Cuba and the United States to where we are here today. He describes in Flowing Prose how the Bacardis were players, key players in both the Cuban independence and revolution, and, uh, but then from their life in exile helped erect the high walls of an embargo that seems to be crumbling today. I think Tom is, what, what Tom has done is really important for both sides of this fight, helping understand a less than black and white human, uh, the less than black and white human stories that make up this history, and with that knowledge, allow us to move to a better relationship in a new century. Um, so with that, let me quickly introduce Tom Jelton. Um, Tom, of course, is uh, most famous for being a correspondent at NPR, um, covering national security and intelligence. He served as NPR's Latin America correspondent from 1986 to 1990, covering the wars in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Colombia. Um, he served in Central Europe, um, and from that uh, authored a previous book, Sarajevo Daily, a city in, and its newspaper under siege, um, a city that I used to live in as well. Um, and uh, he's, in addition to reporting for NPR, uh, Tom is a regular panelist on the PBS program Washington Week. Um, so with that, I, I, I welcome Tom Jelton. I encourage you all to great, buy the great book. It's a great read. Um, uh, sip it with rum and coke. And, uh, and uh, please, Tom. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you all very much. Um, let me say I'm delighted that there are a number of you here, a good number of you here filling this room on a, on a day when I'm sure that there are many other things that could occupy your time. Uh, I'm proud, very proud to be here. I've been at the New America Foundation many times, but always out here, you know, taking advantage of your very important and interesting programs. And in particular, the New America Foundation has been in the lead in Washington for a long time in kind of fostering a sane discussion of U.S.-Cuba policy. Uh, thanks to you, Patrick. Thanks to Steve Clemens and Colonel Wilkins Wilkinson and Anne Yolando French and others who have uh, been involved in the, the U.S.-Cuba policy deliberations. Um, you know, the truth is that uh, there's not a lot that I can add to that discussion. I certainly am not going to defend U.S. policy here. Uh, I'm not going to try to explain it. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm not going to criticize it either. Uh, I, I just don't think that there's much new that I can say 
on this issue. With this book, as Patrick suggested, I intended to take a broader and deeper look at Cuba. Uh, Cuba's relationship with the United States has been a huge and problematic issue throughout much of Cuba's history, especially since the end of Spanish colonial rule, but it is just one issue. And I think that focusing exclusively, to me, focusing exclusively on the U.S.-Cuba relation means paying insufficient attention to other issues in Cuba's modern history and uh, with respect to its future. It's my feeling that with all the hundreds of books written about Cuba and the thousands and thousands of op-ed columns, uh, the discussion about Cuba has hardened around a few themes, and it's lost some of the vitality that uh, the Cuba story to me really warrants. And I say story uh, quite deliberately here, because I think what's needed in talking about Cuba is more storytelling and less diatribe. What do I mean by that? Uh, a well-crafted story does not strive to make a simple political point. It's richer, it's more complex than that, less black and white, as Patrick said. I'm interested as a journalist, I've always been interested more in the gray areas of a story, in the complexity, the nuance, the paradox. Real history is messy. Even the heroes have flaws precisely because they are human. Over time, they may become less heroic. People get tired, they lose their idealism, they get corrupted, that's real life. And when you're out to make a, a political point, you have a tendency to skip over those parts that don't sort of fit uh, with the bottom line. But when you're telling a human story, you include those parts. What I found so intriguing about the Bacardi story is precisely that it conveys something of the drama that has characterized modern Cuban history. The disappointments, the frustrations, the setbacks, the wasted opportunities, the compromises that were made wisely or unwisely. With this book, I cover roughly the last 150 years uh, in this narrative. It's about the Bacardi family, their rum company, and their connection to Cuba's national development. Uh, as a story, it features some wonderful, vivid characters. There's Emilio Bacardi, the eldest son of Don Facundo Bacardi, the Spanish immigrant who moved to Cuba in the early part of the 19th century and established the family rum business. Emilio was the first Bacardi born in Cuba, and he was a real Cuban nationalist, a patriot, a revolutionary, an underground conspirator during the struggle for independence, later the first Cuban mayor of Santiago de Cuba, and a leading senator. The other main character is Pepin Bosch, who came into the family, the Bacardi family, by marrying Don Facundo's granddaughter. He took over the chairmanship of the rum company in the late 1940s and ran it for about 30 years. The adult lives of these two men span about 130 years, and they provide the thread of the Bacardi story in Cuba. It's through their ideas, actions, and experiences, and those of their Bacardi relatives and associates that the whole drama of the Cuban national struggle becomes clear. The Bacardi story, to me, and the larger Cuban story are deeply intertwined. And the Bacardi case provides, for me, I found that it provided an ideal vehicle for making the larger Cuba story come to life. Now, as a story, the Bacardi tale has, like all stories, a beginning, a middle, and an end. It begins with humility and promise and idealism, and it ends with ambiguity and uncertainty and sadness. But even in that regard, it has something in common with Cuba, does it not? The theme is the theme of the book, of the story, is Cuban patriotism, what it means, how it has evolved over times, what became of it. In the 19th century, Cuban patriotism meant supporting the fight for independence. Those of you who are at all familiar with Cuban history may know that there were two long and bloody wars for independence from Spanish colonial rule. The first one uh, began in 1868 and did not end until 1879. Then there was a second one that began in 1895 and ended in 1898. Now, Emilio Bacardi was deeply involved in both of those wars, as a young man in the first war and as an older man in the second. Uh, he was twice imprisoned in Spain. He was twice captured by Spanish authorities and sent off to Spain, deported to Spain and imprisoned uh, for long periods of time. His role, he never took up arms himself, but he was a, he raised money for the rebels. He was kind of an intermediary 
uh, between the, the fighters in the mountains, who are called Mambises, uh, and their supporters in the city. And he, as I say, he uh, was a fundraiser uh, for the movement. He sent his own son, 17 years old, Emilito, off to fight in the Second War with Antonio Maceo. Antonio Maceo is one of the great heroes of Cuban history. He's an Afro-Cuban known as the Bronze Titan, commanded armies, rebel armies in both independence wars, was wounded 27 times. But he's important also as a political symbol uh, because the Cuban national struggle in the 19th century was only partly for independence. The other overarching demand of the movement was for racial justice, an end to slavery and discrimination. This is an aspect of the, of the struggle that doesn't get as much attention, but it was at least as important as the fight for independence. Most of the Cuban rebel fighters were black, as were many of their commanders, including Antonio Maceo, who was a close friend and ally of Emilio Bacardi. Of course, that struggle uh, for independence and racial justice ended not with a clear Cuban triumph, but with a last-minute U.S. military intervention. Cuba went from being under Spain's control to being under a U.S. military occupation. I find it astounding that a war for Cuban independence that began first in 1868 and then in the second phase in 1895, and in which most of the fighting and dying most of the fighting was done by a Cuban army and most of the dying was by Cubans, that that war has gone down in U.S. history as the Spanish-American War of 1898. In fact, the U.S. government did everything it could to thwart Cuba's independence at that time, in large part because of racism. The concern was that Cuba would become, quote, another Haiti, in other words, a free black republic. The U.S. generals who directed the occupation of Cuba, meanwhile, were contemptuous of the Cuban freedom fighters, belittled their contributions, ridiculed their capability to govern themselves. And racism was a huge part of that attitude. So after dealing, in the end, successfully with Spain, Cuban patriots had to deal with U.S. arrogance and domination. This is an important chapter of Cuban history, and I tell it in my book through the experience of Emilio Bacardi, who was the first Cuban mayor of Santiago, which was, it is the major city in eastern Cuba. Uh, this was where the U.S. military first intervened and where the U.S. military occupation was first felt. Emilio dealt personally and head-on with the U.S. military governor, General Leonard Wood, and the relationship between these two men is a fascinating one, and I do explore it at some length uh, in my book. Now, Emilio Bacardi, as I say, is a truly compelling character, one who has not gotten, in my opinion, nearly enough attention uh, in, in Cuban history. You know, the, the Bacardi sort of political profile today um, is very different. Uh, you know, the Bacardis have been stereotyped as a right-wing Republican family, uh, and as Patrick said, and I'll get into this later, they have been, of course, associated with uh, a pretty hardline uh, U.S. policy toward Cuba, but this, this idea of a kind of a right-wing family does not correspond with Emilio Bacardi's own profile. As a Cuban senator, he defended anarchists and socialists. He was a bitter critic of the Cuban church. Uh, he was probably one of the most anti-clerical politicians in Cuba. In Santiago, he was a founder of the Victor Hugo Free Thinker Group. Uh, in his own writings, he questioned the divinity of Jesus. With his wife, interestingly, he actually founded a Raja Yoga school in Santiago. He and his, he had, he and his wife had, uh, his second wife, Elvira Cape, had six daughters, and they raised them to be suffragettes. Uh, he was always very closely associated with, perhaps because he had so many daughters, with the movement for women's rights. At the same time, and this is sort of the other side of Emilio and what makes him really interesting, he was very pragmatic. Uh, he was actually very pro-American. He, unlike a lot of the Cuban uh, revolutionary veterans who were uh, naturally dismayed by the U.S. military occupation and then sat on the sidelines basically complaining uh, about the United States, in spite of his own feelings about 
the war for independence and his anger at the Americans, which was real, he decided to work very closely with Leonard Wood and had a very good working relationship with him because he believed this was what was needed for Cuba's betterment. And, and the truth is that during those four years that the United States occupied Cuba, a lot of good things were done, largely in the area of infrastructure repair, street repair, schools being built. Emilio focused on those things and sort of ignored the political differences that he had with General Wood and the uh, American occupiers. So this sort of exemplifies the pragmatic attitude that Emilio always had towards the contributions that he could make to Cuba. And he was a businessman. He was president of the Santiago Chamber of Commerce. Most of the time, his father died in 1886. He was the president of the Bacardi Rum Company. So on the one hand, he was a prominent Cuban businessman at the same time that he was, as I say, a Cuban nationalist and politician. He was actually very, in, in a sense, he was very pro-American in the sense that he sent his children, all of his children, to be educated in the United States. He loved many things about the country and he wrote about it. Um, politically, he was much more anti-imperialist than anti-American. His view was that the United States, simply because of its size, its power, and its proximity to Cuba, would inevitably be a problem for the country. In one of the last essays that he wrote on this subject, he explained his view on U.S.-Cuba relations by quoting an Italian historian and socialist by the name of Guglielmo Ferrero. And this is what he quoted Ferrero as saying and endorsing this view as his analysis of the U.S.-Cuba relationship. Quote, never, not in the past nor today, has any nation governed another people with a spirit of justice. It is not to stop them from falling that it extends a hand, but rather to push them all the faster toward the bottom of the abyss. So that's Emilio Bacardi. He died in 1922. Now, in the 20th century, Cuban patriotism takes on a different meaning. It's less focused on the United States, and it becomes focused more on Cuba's own homegrown dictators, first Gerardo Machado and later Fulgencio Batista. The progressive movement in Cuba, to the extent there was one, was directed in those years more against those Cuban corrupt repressive governments than it was directed against external challenges. Once again, I can tell this story through sort of Bacardi examples. There's a Bacardi angle throughout this period as well because the Bacardi Rum Company in the 20th century emerges as the single biggest industrial enterprise outside the sugar sector that is wholly Cuban, entirely owned by a single Cuban family and one with a reputation for patriotism. As a company, uh, the Bacardi Rum Company is known for its integrity and for the example it sets as a responsible, a responsible corporate citizen and a good employer. And the leading Bacardi character during this period is Pepin Bosch. Pepin Bosch was a conspirator in the revolution of uh, Cuban Revolution of 1933, another revolution. Cuba's had a lot of revolutions, incidentally, and not just the ones in the 19th century and the more famous one in the 50s. Cuba's had several. And one revolution that has not gotten a lot of attention in the United States is the revolution of 1933, which was uh, directed against Gerardo Machado. Uh, Pepin Bosch was one of the conspirators uh, in that revolution. Later, Bosch tangled with uh, Fulgencio Batista. Um, the Bacardi Rum Company was actually taken over temporarily by Batista in the 1940s, uh, largely because of uh, the Bacardi's political opposition uh, to the Batista government. Uh, now, President Carlos Prio actually brought Pepin Bosch into his government. Uh, this would be in 1949 as finance minister, uh, precisely because of Bosch's reputation as incorruptible. But Bosch did not last long. He was disgusted by the continuing corruption that he found all around him, and in particular by the amount of tax evasion that he encountered among his fellow Cuban businessmen. And then you know, of course, that uh, Fulgencio Batista, who was out of government at the time, who was a candidate to be for the presidential elections in 1952, running third uh, behind the two leading candidates, um, did not wait, Batista did not wait for those elections to take place. He overthrew Carlos Prio in a military coup in 1952. At that point, Pepin Bosch became one of the leading opponents of the Batista dictatorship in Cuba. And when Fidel Castro's 26th of July movement emerged, Pepin Bosch was among his principal supporters and financiers. 
If you read U.S. press coverage of the Cuban Revolution, as I did in writing this book, you'll find just one Cuban businessman consistently willing to go on the record in interviews with foreign correspondents denouncing Batista and supporting the Cuban Revolution. Many Cuban businessmen were sort of waiting to see how this fight would come out. They were hedging their bets, maybe supporting uh, Batista publicly and Castro privately. Uh, Bosch, on the other hand, was very outspoken and, as I say, willing to go on the record saying that he believed and supported the Cuban Revolution. He personally contrib contributed about $38,000 of his own money to buy weapons for the 26th of July movement. I did the inflation calculation here. This would be the equivalent of contributing about $250,000 cash today. In January 1959, when the new government came to power, uh, Pepin Bosch went personally to the finance ministry two weeks after Fidel took power with a check for $450,000, which was his estimate of how much business income taxes Bacardi would owe that year, and he wanted to pay the, the business income tax uh, in advance in order to help the new government get on a solid financial footing because Batista had fled with so much of the country's fortune. April 1959, Fidel Castro makes his one and only official trip to Washington, and he chooses one Cuban businessman to go with him, Pepin Bosch of Bacardi uh -huh. Rum. Now, shortly after that, uh, Pepin Bosch began to have his doubts of, about Fidel Castro, but most of the Bacardi family uh, continued to believe in the revolution. They stayed in, in Cuba and they cooperated uh, with the revolution uh, for another year and a half after that. This is, of course, well after the U.S. government and much of the Cuban bourgeoisie had given up on Fidel Castro. The Bacardis uh, were saying this uh, we needed this revolution. We need sweeping social and economic change. This is a government that we can work with. And even we as capitalists are willing to pay more taxes and support agrarian reform and a redistribution of wealth because we think this is something that the country needs. In fact, uh, probably there is no um, and as I say, there's no company in Cuba with a higher profile in support of the revolution during this time than the Bacardi Rum Company and the Bacardis as individual family members. Uh, what happens next? October 1960, uh, the Cuban Fidel and Raul and Che Guevara and the rest of the leadership of the revolution make a decision to go for socialism in Cuba. And as a result, uh, there is the nationalization of uh, basically all of the major industrial enterprises, with the exception of some very small companies um, at that time. And that included the Bacardi Rum Company. In spite of the fact that, that Bacardi as a company and as a family had been supportive of the revolution, they were caught up in this wave of nationalization as well. Interestingly enough, when I was reporting this book in Cuba, I, I tracked down Enrique Oltulski, who was the vice minister of industry under Che Guevara at the time that the expropriation took place. And I said to him, why did you nationalize the Bacardi Rum Company when they had this profile of being so supportive of the revolution and so loyal to it? And he said it had nothing to do with the Bacardis as a family or with their company. It was nothing personal. Uh, indeed, the Bacardis did have a, a, a revolutionary profile in Cuba, but this was a measure, a national measure that we took across the whole country, and we did not carve out an exception uh, for the Bacardis. Well, as you can imagine, having sort of been out on a gone out in a limb in support uh, of the revolution and Fidel Castro with their fellow members of the business class and the bourgeoisie. Um, once they left Cuba and went into exile, uh, they felt betrayed. Uh, they felt they had been double-crossed. And as you can imagine, I think in a, what would be a, a, the kind of reaction that we've seen in world history in, in, on many similar occasions, the Bacardis in exile basically do a 180 and they, be, they begin taking the lead in exile in opposing Fidel Castro. Pepin Bosch, having been Fidel Castro's best friend with Mama in the Cuban business class, becomes one of the leading conspirators in the anti-Castro movement, an occasional ally of the CIA, a sponsor of clandestine sabotage missions on the island. 
and Bacardi Money underwrites much of the political activism of the Cuban exile community. The Cuban American National Foundation, for example, which for many years was uh, the leading uh, political activist organization in the exile community, was a direct offshoot of Bacardi-sponsored lobbying. Uh, Jorge Mascanosa, who was the founding president of the Cuban American National Foundation, was a protege of Pepin Bosch. He was actually the nephew of Pepin Bosch's right-hand man, Polo Miranda, who was sort of Bosch's, he, Bosch had him in, uh, working, Polo Miranda working full-time on Cuba-related issues, and Polo Miranda uh, got a job for his nephew, Jorge Mascanosa, who at the time was just a milkman in Miami, um, working uh, with, uh, with Pepin Bosch in particular, uh, and he goes on to found the Cuban American National Foundation. So, you know, even at this point, you can see that no matter what, what phase of Cuban history you're talking about, there's always a little bit of a Bacardi angle. Bacardi's either as minor participants or witnesses, or in some way, they are living the Cuban national drama, which is why, uh, which is why it is so convenient to sort of weave a story of Cuban development around the Bacardi tale. Now, in exile, uh, and this is certainly from the Bacardi point of view, uh, the Bacardi leadership of the anti-Castro movement uh, is just one more manifestation uh, of their Cuban patriotism, which is now exercised from outside Cuba. As I say, in every phase of Cuban history, the idea of Cuban patriotism uh, evolves and has different meanings. Uh, and to the Bacardis, this is just the latest. Uh, their activism uh, in the anti-Castro movement is just the latest manifestation of their nationalism and their patriotism. They wanted to go back, they intended to go back to Cuba, some of them still do. The, now, but the, the story of, of Bacardi uh, activism in this later stage uh, does sort of underscore one point, which is the way that the experience of exile can be very embittering. Uh, I, I say that this new version of, of Cuban patriotism, as exemplified by the Bacardis, was angrier, it was less liberal, it was more negative, and it was more spiteful than what came before it. And unlike the patriotism of Emilio Bacardi, which was closely tied to a demand for Cuban sovereignty and freedom from U.S. hegemony, the exiled Cuban patriots with the Bacardis in the lead uh, were willing to work through and with the U.S. government. Uh, as Patrick said, the Bacardis were strong supporters of the U.S. embargo, certainly in, in the beginning, when the island started to open to foreign investment and European and Canadian companies began rushing in, the Bacardis saw those moves as putting at risk their own interests on the island. Bacardi lobbyists were instrumental in the passage of the Helms-Burton Act, which punishes some foreign investors in Cuba, and then there was, of course, the big battle with Pernod Ricard, over who would have control of the Cuban rum industry in a post-Castro Cuba. That's the way I interpret this struggle. I think it has very much to do with the future of Cuba. And uh, you may know that Bacardi went so far as to get the U.S. Congress to approve legislation, which was written expressly to support their legal case. And during this period, the Bacardis were allied with uh, Congressman Tom DeLay uh, of other people. That was an alliance that tarnished uh, the Bacardi reputation. I do say this is a rather sad chapter in many ways uh, in the Bacardi Cuba story, but it is part of the story. I mean, I, you know, I, I really have tried uh, with this book to portray a kind of a warts and all uh, account. I, I do think that it's important that this story be seen in its in entirety and not just sliced up into particular historical periods. Um, I say this is a kind of a concluding sad chapter in the Bacardi Cuba story, but I think it's too soon to assume that it is the, in fact, the final chapter. Uh, there may be another one. There is now a new generation of Bacardi family leaders, and I think that in contrast to the generation that went through uh, the embittering experience of exile, the new generation of Bacardi family leaders does tend to look forward much more than backward. And so there may yet be another chapter to this Bacardi Cuba story and that one, one that will perhaps turn in a somewhat different direction. Now, that's sort of the panorama of the Bacardi Cuba story. Um, I, I think that, you know, in terms of what are some of the lessons that it, it teaches, you know, I have a few points to make and then we're going to open it up to, 
uh, to discussion. I think um, one thing I have to say is that I am a little troubled by the tendency in liberal circles to demonize Cuban exiles as crazy, hardline, intransigent right-wing extremists. I have seen that tendency come out uh, here in Washington. You know, there is this, I mean, I've been covering foreign affairs in Latin America for a long time. I think there's this kind of um, liberal oversimplification where, for example, Chilean exiles are good, Cuban exiles are bad. Um, I think it's really important to look in a more substantive way at, at what ex the experience of exile does to people, how, what is it that drives people into exile, whether you're talking about Chilean exiles or Cuban exiles. I think that there needs to be sensitivity to the idea that it is very hard on people to leave their homeland to go into exile. I think there are many Cuban exiles and in fact are uh, Cuban nationalists, Cuban patriots, Jorge Mascanosa was famous for saying that he felt more Cuban than American. I think one has to think long and hard about how painful an, uh, a decision it is to go into exile. I also think an important point to be made is, uh, and this is with respect to Cuban exiles in particular, just because many have been deeply anti-Castro does not necessarily mean they are right-wing on all issues. Pepin Bosch adored Ronald Reagan for his anti-communism views. Uh, he supported, the, in his view, the anti-communist struggle around the world. But what's less well known is that he actually criticized Ronald Reagan quite vigorously in public and in writing over his economic policies. He believed that Reagan's economic policies favored the rich. And he was not entirely unique in that regard among Cuban exiles. Another point that I think it, that has to be made, you know, we, we use the word obsession a lot in talking about the way Cuban exiles, uh, you know, view uh, Fidel Castro and the, their, their movement. Um, and as I say, they have a reputation for being somewhat crazy. Um, I think it's worthwhile to think for a moment about whether Fidel Castro shares some of the responsibility for that mentality. Uh, and this is why I say that. The Cuban regime has genuinely promoted hatred, and that is not too strong a word, hatred for the exile community. In the early years of the revolution, Cubans who wanted to leave rather than live uh, under that political system had to stand in line at a foreign embassy to get a visa. Uh, militantes uh, were sent out uh, to those embassies with the assignment of taunting the people who were standing in line, jeering at them, spitting at them. And then you can look at the rhetoric of Fidel Castro himself. This is from a speech he gave in 1962. He said, what do the ones who left signify? It is the same thing as squeezing a pimple. Those who have left are the pus the pus that was expelled when the Cuban Revolution squeezed the society. How good the body feels when pus is eliminated. Now, if something like that were said by Rush Limbaugh or Ann Coulter, we would call it hate speech. But this was said by Fidel Castro about Cubans who were making this decision to go into exile. Uh, we also are very familiar with the, these organized anti-Obama town hall meetings that have been taking place recently, and you know there is some evidence that they have been orchestrated. Uh, but something similar uh, happens in Cuba. They are often there are staged demonstrations against dissidents in Cuba. Uh, they are called actos de repudio, acts of repudiation, when militantes are actually sent by the authorities out to harass dissidents, jeer at them, verbally abuse them, in some cases even attack them physically. So to the extent there is real enmity between Cubans on the island and those in exile, I think that it is something that the Cuban authorities have to take at least some responsibility for fomenting. Um, I think that there is a kind of a strategic aspect to this as well. A very important quote from Fidel from 1961 that, I, again, um, one that I don't think has gotten enough attention. Fidel wrote in 1961, a revolution that does not have an enemy in front of it runs the risk of lulling itself to sleep. In his view, in Fidel's view, the Cuban Revolution needed a counter-revolution in Miami simply to demonstrate its legitimacy. Another point I think that it's important to to uh, keep in mind and one that emerges directly from a analysis of Cuban history. Uh, yes, the exiles, you know, took matters into their own harm, uh, own hands. They participated in the Bay of Pigs invasion. There were countless sabotage missions where uh, exiles were involved in going back to try to uh, 
physically overthrow uh, the Castro government and take up arms. But, you know, one point to consider is that this is actually in keeping with Cuban political culture. There's always been, going back over 100 years, a tendency in Cuba to pursue political change through violence. And again, Pepin Bosch is a perfect example of this. He organized paramilitary missions against Fidel Castro in the 1960s. I have a section in my book where I talk about him actually buying an airplane and trying to find a pilot who would fly it back on bombing missions in Cuba. Uh, he never was able to find a pilot who would do that. It was a suicidal mission. It did not have the support of the CIA. It was going to be a single B-26 bomber flying all, all by itself uh, in Cuba. As I say, it would have been a suicidal mission. Um, it didn't happen. But that did illustrate that Pepin Bosch was willing, was actively seeking out missions like this. But what is important here is this was the third time he had done something like this. In 1933, he was the treasurer of a movement to buy weapons for uh, a, a militia force to attack uh, Machado. And then, as I say, in the 1950, he was buying weapons for the 26th of July movement and actively supporting an armed rebellion, an armed rebellion that included assassination, that included uh, terrorism, that included sabotage. There was tremendous violence on the part of Batista. I'm only making a point that when Pepin Bosch resorted to violence in his determination to overthrow Fidel Castro in the 1960s, it was actually the third time he had done this, and it was in keeping with this kind of uh, political um, culture of uh, political violence uh, in Cuba. So again, um, you can tell uh, the fact that I'm able to cite Bacardi examples in sort of talking about Cuba and U.S.-Cuba relations over all these years just underscores the, the remarkable way that you can tell the whole Cuba story around Bacardi escapades and activities. Um, and as I say, uh, in closing, I want to just return to this, this original point that, that what I've tried to do in this book is really tell a Cuba story, not a U.S.-Cuba story. There's clearly a couple chapters that deal with the, uh, the, uh, the war, the independence wars, and the U.S. role there. But um, I, I think that it, it, you know, one of the things that I try to do as a journalist is to try to bridge this incredibly broad gap uh, between you know, those who support um, the Cuban Revolution and Fidel Castro and those who so vigorously oppose it, I think there are ways that we can sort of try to navigate that very troubled uh, middle portion. We don't, for example, have to make a choice between either supporting U.S. policy or supporting the Cuban government. Those are issues that I think can be evaluated separately. And I do think, now in my one little comment about U.S.-Cuba policy, I do think this is this could be easier under an Obama administration. I know that some speakers, previous speakers here at the New America Foundation have downplayed or belittled the uh, changes that are, are likely to happen in U.S. policy under President Obama, but I would emphasize, at least in a symbolic way, uh, how important um, uh, these circumstances are. Uh, Barack Obama is an Afro, uh, African American president who is speaking directly to what is now largely an Afro Cuban population. You know, some estimates are that 60 to 70 percent of the population of Cuba is Afro Cuban. That's a dynamic that I think cannot be underestimated. It's something that is absolutely without parallel in U.S. Cuba. Uh, history. Um, he has asked for a new beginning. He is asking Cubans not to blame him for policies that were drawn up before he was born. And he is, he is emphasizing issues that resonate with a much broader segment of the Cuban people. You don't hear as much talk about political prisoners as you do, for example, about the right to travel, which is an issue that, uh, you know, directly impacts uh, many Cubans. You've also seen in Cuba the emergence of critical voices whose dissidence is not clearly tied to the United States. People like Ioani Sanchez, whose writings and observations as a blogger emphasize, in her view, the hollowness of the Cuban government regime, the predictable and tiresome rhetoric, and the alienation that many Cubans feel. This is something that really caught my attention from one of her recent blog posts. Every day I run into someone else who has become disillusioned. There are those who turn in their Communist Party cards and emigrate to live with their married daughter in Italy, or those who choose the peaceful work of caring for their grandchildren and waiting in line for bread. 
I sense this conversion, slow in some, dizzyingly fast in others, all around me, as if under the island sun, thousands have shed their skins. But the metamorphosis proceeds in only one direction. I have not run into anyone, and I know a lot of people, who has gone from disbelief to loyalty, who has begun to trust in the speeches after years of criticizing them. Well, Ioannis, I think one of the most encouraging developments is that Ioannis' blog is now linked to the Huffington Post. We are finally beginning to see sort of discussions about Cuba and U.S. Cuba policy removed from this ideological polarization that has surrounded it for so long, and I think that's good. So let me underscore again, I am not here to make a political argument. What I've tried to do with this book is to return the discussion of Cuba back to the gray areas to restore the nuance, the complexity, and the richness that this story really represents. Thank you very much. That was wonderful, Tom. Thank you. Um, please stay, um, and we'll, we'll do some q and I'll take the first uh, crack, and then we'll open it up to the floor. We've got a microphone, so if you can wait for the microphone and then uh, state your name and uh, then ask Tom the question, we'll try to get around to as many people as possible. Um, Tom, in the last chapter of the book, uh, you write about a visit that uh, Amelia Bacardi took with her husband uh -huh. um, to the island. And, right. and, um, and that coming away from that experience, um, as, as with kind of this theme that we've been talking about, that things were not as black and white uh, right. for her well, as absolutely. much. Um, right. Could you talk about the sense of the, the current generation of uh, Bacardi's, the, the new Facundo Bacardi right. who's running um, the, the, the empire, could you talk about their perspective and what they're looking at, uh, again, in, this, in this, this very changed environment that we live in today? Sure. Yeah, Facundo Bacardi is, um, oh, I think he's in his late 30s or early 40s. He was actually born in the United States. This is the current chairman of the board of Bacardi. He's the na his, you know, named Facundo Bacardi. What better, more appropriate name? But his uh, native language is not Spanish, as I say, he was born in the United States. And um, he feels a little uncomfortable, actually, talking uh, about Cuba because he doesn't have that uh, experience. So I think that, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, he has been quoted as saying that he intends to be the chairman of Bacardi who will lead the company back to Cuba. But it is not at all clear what he means by that. I don't think that, um, from what I know, and this is a private company and their deliberations are private, I don't see any evidence that they intend to go back and sort of go back into rum production. I think they would like to go back to Cuba and sort of reassociate their name with, uh, you know, let's say, uh, humanitarian causes or, or something like that. Uh, so I think there is a different viewpoint. Just to finish the story of Amelia, because it's a very important story. She went back. So many, you know, as I said before, so many Cuban exiles are very angry about having left Cuba, and they still harbor these thoughts of going back and recovering their properties, recovering, you know, stuff that was taken from them. Amelia went back, and uh, she had none of those feelings. She's, and she actually was very non-judgmental. Uh, you know, she met many, many Cubans who were not dissidents, uh, you know, who had never taken any opposition, period, a stance of opposition to the government, who had held positions uh, in responsible positions in the Cuban state. In other words, in her attitude, if I can characterize it, was, I'm not going to pass judgment on them. They've been here living here for 50 years. Uh, I am not, I do not, I have nothing but sympathy for the difficulty, the hardship that they have gone through economically uh, in these years, and I, for one, have no interest in trying to reclaim my properties and so forth. Um, and she, uh, it has to be said, she took, I think, some grief from other members of the family for her willingness to go back and for her willingness to meet and, and sort of get to know Cuba as it exists today. Um, but I think that there have been gradually more and more family members who have been going back quietly, uh, sort of as tourists or, you know, I mean, particularly younger generation, ones who were born here, who have American names, American passports, but are curious about Cuba and curious about their own family roots there. So, you know, this is, we have talked, you have talked often here at the New America Foundation about the changes in the uh, Cuban-American demographic and the changing political profile of the Cuban-American community. And the Bacardis are right squarely in the middle of that. I mean, the same changes that you have noticed about the sort of the political profile of the Cuban-American community are reflected as well in the younger generations of the Bacardi family. 
Great. Thank you, Tom. Um, I want to open it up to uh, the audience. Um, Andrew's got the, the microphone, so if you could raise your hand and then state your name. Um, we'll do it real fast yes, and easy right here. Susan Kinsley. Mm -hmm. um, I spent 94-95 uh, uh, running a program for in Guantanamo for Cuban boat people right. and, and Haitian boat people who were there. And, and it, your statistic about the demographic of Cuba does not jive at all with what I saw. Almost all, I'd say at least 90, 95 percent of the boat people um, were Caucasian looking from Cuba. Um, and I'm wondering, this may be slightly off the Bacardi point, but I'm wondering how this plays into you know, those who, who left Cuba and, and the ideology of, of, of Cubans both there and here. Um, I mean, were, was it mainly the, 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 the Caucasian Cubans who left um, and, and, and did the revolution then become an, an Afro-Cuban movement? You know, some, I haven't read anything about this, and I'm curious if you have any insight on it. Well, there's no question at all. The first wave of, of uh, exile was almost was overwhelmingly white. There's no question about that. And of course, it's those early uh, immigrants who have uh, achieved the most financially because they got a head start, uh, or because they were well educated, or because they were, you know, uh, sort of had business backgrounds or professional backgrounds for whatever reason. Those are the Cuban. Americans now who have the most money, which means that to the extent they still support family members, family members on the island, you're seeing a a division of the Cuban population between those who benefit from remittances, which are predominantly disproportionately white, and those who do not, which are disproportionately non-white. Um, now, as far as the, I'm less convinced that it would be, 95, 99 percent seems like an exaggeration. I, I was at Guantanamo as well. I was in Cuba in 1994 for two months covering the Balsetto exodus. It looked to me like it was a real cross-section of the population that was leaving. You know, I mean, Cuba in, in 1994, remember, was just recovering, was in the so-called special period. It was recovering from the loss of something like $5 billion a year in subsidies from the socialist bloc. Uh, Cubans were suffering economically tremendously during that period, and naturally those who were had the least resources, the fewest resources, suffered the most. So I would, I would guess that it was a more cross-section of the population that was leaving, the one that I noticed. But as far as my figure, you know, it's very hard to talk about the racial demographic in Cuba because we don't have... In the United States, we have very sort of, we have white people and we have black people. You know, in Cuba, we have very fixed, we are very fixed in our racial ideas. In, in Cuba and in many other Latin American countries, it's far more, people have a far sort of more, what's the word, kind of liberal attitude towards race. And so you see a much more of a racial continuum. And where do you draw the line? Now, when I say 60 to 70 percent are Afro-Cuban, I mean Cubans with at least some African heritage. Mulatos is a word that you hear a lot in Cuba. Um, and that figure actually comes from, you know, a CIA fact book. Um, and I can't vouch for it, that, but I, have, I, I can say that that is sort of generally thrown out there as sort of the conventional view of the demographic population today. Okay, thanks. Another question. Uh, in the back, sir. Just state your name. Sure. My name is John Howard, and I'm just a long right. time. Right, hi, John. How are you? I'm a long time student of things Cuban, yeah. no professional connection at present. Uh, you mentioned in your talk uh, the notion that the Cuban government needed a counter revolution to, mm -hmm. I guess, in some sense, justify its own revolution. Uh, what is your sense uh, today? Do you sense that that is the practice today? I think it's, I sense that it's been the practice. In the past, for example, Congress here would yep. consider legislation, for example, to open up sales of food and medicine. And around the time of the vote, the Cubans would do something that would energize South Florida's delegation that would put an end to the vote or something like that. Is that something that you sense is operative today with the current government and more importantly, perhaps, with the new emerging uh, government under Raul Castro? I think you've put your finger, John, on perhaps the most, uh, a, a really critical issue, and it's one that I can't answer uh, definitively. I mean, my personal opinionated sense, and I should, should have made clear at the beginning that I wrote a book about Cuba in sort of my, I took a leave from NPR to write this book, and I am up here in my capacity as a writer, as someone who wrote a book about Cuba, not up here as a NPR correspondent. 
my personal opinion is that uh, that Fidel seems to me because he was you know I quoted that was a quote from Fidel this was Fidel's origin this was Fidel's feeling uh, and I think it remains to the extent it remains operative it remains Fidel's f feeling w the big unquestioned uh, unanswered question is to the extent to which Raul is as locked into this kind of adversarial view uh, of the United States. I get the feeling that he is not nearly as locked into it. The, the rhetoric that I've heard from Ra Raul is, tends to be much more focused on practical issues uh, and we have seen, as Patrick mentioned, we've seen a number of steps from this government uh, in the direction of normalizing relations with the United States. Now, you know, if there was a vested interest in maintaining this hostile relationship with the United States, that would not explain why the Cuban government has been willing to reach out to the United States on so many different fronts right now. But, you know, personally, as I say, I think this might be one issue in which Fidel and Raul don't see the world exactly the same. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think um, it was a recent statement from one of Raul's speeches, I think, to the, uh, to the legislature, saying uh, we cannot continue to just blame the United States for all the problems. We have to um, solve them for ourselves, and and to some something to that effect, and, and and it's it's not the kind of statement that you would you would generally tend to do. Plus, you know, this this great example of a of uh, the uh, cooperation of the fence line in Guantanamo over these disaster uh, response exercises uh, that are joint military. It's very hard to um, to make the argument to your people that this is an evil uh, force that's 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 out to do us ill if we're doing conducting joint military exercises with them and we're doing a lot of counter narcotic exercise and all this stuff. So it's my sense is that there is a there is a break, but is there is there just a new line in the sand out there? That's I think the big open yeah. question out there. Thanks. Uh, another question from the fifth floor, right here. Um, so Diana Gregory, I'm just wondering, um, following up on this thought about Raul being less fixed on, fixated on things than his brother. Um, do you think once Fidel dies that there would be some sudden change or is there, what, I mean, do you think it'd be very gradual? I mean, I'm just asking you to make a prediction. You yeah, know, no, obviously I, at some you know, point he's going I to just, die. Uh, Definitely actually, not NPR now. <laughs> definitely not. Well, actually, I just wrote an article, uh, which some of you might find interesting in the journal World Affairs. Um, it came out in the summer issue, sort of where I where I get into this, and I begin by talking about this 1994 Balsero uh, crisis, when there were a thousand Cubans leaving the island every day, and uh, including doctors, engineers, you know, taxi drivers, Communist Party members, and you know, I, I just I had just come back from four years in Central Europe and witnessing the collapse of. Poland, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Hungary, one after another. And the conclusion that many of us drew is that these systems are very, are like a house of cards. And once they're sort of challenged, they collapse. A lot of us came back and figured the same thing was going to happen in Cuba. And then, you know, and then I'm there in August and September of 1994 when a 1,000 Cubans are leaving a day and people are gathering on the beaches and saying, isn't it tr sad that our young people are leaving the island, you know, because they see no future here for them. And that was, in a sense, a, you know, a moment of um, realization, I think, for, for a lot of Cubans. So I, you know, I was convinced at that time that the, that the Cuban government, the Cuban revolution was on its last legs. And uh, Andres Oppenheimer wrote a famous book, Castro's Final Days or Final Hours or something like that. Final hour. Final hour. That was 15 years ago. You know, so I, I, I tell that story in this article I write, and I say, boy, I learned from that never to make predictions. I mean, I, Cuba I found to be a really inscrutable nation. You think you've figured out, and then something happens, and it's once again it becomes mysterious. So that's the all prelude. Now, nevertheless, I think that you cannot overstate the importance that Fidel Castro has in the definition of the Cuban Revolution. And I think the amount of power uh, that Fidel has had over the last 50 years. The way that he has dominated sort of all things in Cuba um, means that once he is genuinely gone from the scene, I think that, you know, it's going to be very hard to, to predict what will happen. I think that I interviewed Jorge Dominguez on this issue from Cuba Watcher from Harvard, and he said, famous, I remember what he said, he said, the term vacuum of power does not begin 
to describe what's going to happen in the post Castro period. But, you know, again, who knows? Big boots to fill. Okay. Uh, and back with the tie. Just, I, w I won't ask you any more policy, but by the way, I, I think it's a, a wonderful presentation. It's a Cuban American, Joe very Garcia. respectful. Yes. Yes. Joe, Joe Garcia. Garcia. Joe Garcia, welcome. Uh, I wanted to ask you about. Uh, Former president of the Cuban American National Foundation. Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about uh, the, the Vilma Spin and, right. the, and, and sort of that relationship. You talked yes. about the back and forth, and if there's one family that sort of, and I know it from, since I know a lot of the Bacardis you were talking about, at least the living ones. Um, and I knew Amalia, who's a fascinating uh, a character and, and very helpful to Jorge Mas to sort of the, the, give that relationship, because I assume you covered it a little bit in yeah. the book and I haven't mm -hmm. had a chance to read. Yeah. Uh, Vilma Espin is the daughter of Jose Espin. Jose Espin uh, was a, um, he was a Cuban, but he was very interested in France and spoke fluent French. And he was actually the uh, Belgian consul maybe in, in Cuba? I don't know. But at any rate, the president, the, Emilio Bacardi's brother-in-law was a guy by the name of Enrique Schweig, who was a French Cuban. And he came, and Jose Espin and Enrique Schweig, so Enrique Schweig was president of, of the company between Emilio and Pepin Bosch. He was the intermediate, he was the intervening president for many, many years, a fascinating guy always took his French roots very seriously. Jose Espin was a fluent French speaker and somehow the two got together and Jose Espin became Enrique's right-hand man. And in fact, when Enrique Schweig then was in his final years, there was some speculation that if the leadership of the Bacardi Rum Company was going to go to somebody outside the family, it would go to Jose Espin. He was a very senior executive in the company. He was not a family member, but he was as senior as any non-Bacardi family member was in that company. Uh, and, it, as, and, and actually pretty conservative. He was, you know, if you reconstruct the labor history of Bacardi, Jose Espin was the bad guy. He was the guy that was always sort of like the unions were battling with him throughout the 30s and, and the 40s. Um, his daughter, Vilma Espin, very bright young woman. She's the first female graduate in chemical engineering from the University of Santiago. His father's dream, her father's dream for Vilma is that she go to MIT and pursue her chemical engineering studies. And he begged her and pressured her, and finally she agreed to go to MIT. But this was in 1952, 53, 54, in that period. And she, as a young college student in in Cuba got swept up in the revolution and she came back, she actually left MIT early, came back uh, and joined the revolution mm -hmm. and went out in the mountains with the other uh, 26th of July movements and became romantically involved with Raul Castro and ultimately married him. Uh, and she was, I, I describe in my book, a, a, a remarkable wedding, the wedding of Raul Castro and Vilma Espin in January of 1959, shortly after the revolution took power, where, where Vilma Espin, there's a picture of her in, in the book, she is her father, you know, a very wealthy family. She is totally, even though she's been fighting in the mountains, she's all made up in this beautiful long white dress and lace and there's flowers all over the place. Raul shows up at the wedding like an hour late, you know, in his guerrilla uniform and a beard and his 26th of July beret and he's bringing all his, his um, fellow fighters with him and they have, they've been up in the mountains for years and not eating well and there's this huge feast laid out with wedding cake and champagne and everything else and they just gorge themselves at the table and, and it's this remarkable moment it's sort of to me it's kind of the last moment where you see a kind of a confluence of the uh, bourgeoisie in Santiago and the guerrilla fighters represented by this wedding of Vilma Espin and Raul Castro. Well, uh, Vilma Espin goes on to be a very important person. She's sometimes considered the first lady, or was considered the first lady of Cuba. Fidel's um, wife or wives were rarely seen in public, and whenever there was a need for sort of a woman to sort of be the first lady, he would turn to his sister-in-law, Vilma Espin. She died just uh, two years ago, I believe it was, uh, but again, she is the product of this Bacardi sort of um, Fidel uh, rapprochement that existed for a while. Great, right, thank you. The, the children are still stockholders in the company, yeah, because her father was one of the few non family members who actually had stock in the company. Uh, and as I understand it, Joe, you may know better than I do, but the Bacardi family gets together because they still own this company completely. It's, it's now like a $15 billion company. It's still owned 
by five, six hundred family members, and they get together once a year. Uh, and the aspines, some the offspring, sometimes show up to vote their shares. Uh, you know, it's kind of a remarkable moment. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. Another question uh, right here in the suspenders. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Jim Carr. Uh, there's been sort of a resurgence in things Theodore Roosevelt mm -hmm. <laughs> in the U.S., mm -hmm. and I'm wondering how he's perceived in Cuba and if there are any memorials or anything to him. Uh, there is a, a there is a memorial to Teddy Roosevelt and the free, and the and the uh, and the uh, uh, the what are they called the the Rough Riders. The Rough Riders. Thank you, Bert. <laughs> the Rough Riders, but it was built by the Americans, so <laughs> and it's there in in Santiago. Um, you know, um, I think that Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt was not. He was he was Secretary of the Navy. I, I think uh, assistant, assistant. assistant Secretary of the Navy. I mean, he wasn't. You know, a really important person. He was not there. He was just there as another young officer in the, in the Rough Riders. Leonard Wood was the commander of the, of the Rough Riders. Um, so the, you know, the U.S. military intervention in Cuba was not really closely associated with Teddy Roosevelt personally, but certainly it represent, he represented or exemplified this expansionist idea that motivated U.S. foreign policy during that period. He believed that the United States should totally Dominate the Caribbean because it, uh, you know, it it was such it was such, the Cuba was a very strategically uh, 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 situated place, and he was a strong believer in naval uh, projecting a naval presence along with uh, what's his name, Alfred Mann, uh, who's the you know famous naval commander. So. Teddy Roosevelt's philosophy lies, or ideology, certainly lies behind the U.S. intervention, but he is not, I don't think he's seen as the, sort of the, the bad guy, as it were, behind the U.S. Uh, occupation. Great, thanks. Um, all the way in the back. Mary Speck. Hi, Mary. Oh, hey, Mary. Um, I just wondered if you could comment a little bit, if you know, and you, of course, spent a lot of time in Cuba, apart from your research on the Bacardis, but how are the Bacardis, and more generally the Republic, viewed in, in Cuba today. Um, I have to say my own impression living in Havana was that there was, we all know about the extraordinary nostalgia that exists in Miami. There's right. a whole industry built around right. it. Right. But even in Cuba, people will talk about how their grandmothers would tell them about what El Encanto used to look like. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and I wondered if that was your impression, whether it's just a Havana phenomenon or whether there is an evolving view over this republic which was for so long vilified um, and of the Bacardi family as well, whether that change in mentality is occurring in Cuba, whether you have any insight. I think to, to an extent. Uh, I mean, I think the, Cubans, the, the Cuban authorities are extremely sophisticated about, about history and about what points they want to emphasize and what points they want to ignore. And as far as the Bacardis are concerned, what has happened is that for all the reasons that I laid out, Emilio Bacardi, I mean, how can you possibly say that Emilio Bacardi was anything but a Cuban patriot, given the positions that he took at the time and what he represented? Um, you know, sort of the Bacardi family profile in general, or the Bacardi company profile, is different. So what you've seen, for example, in Havana, I think a very interesting development, is that the uh, Edificio Bacardi, which is the old Bacardi office building in downtown Havana, beautiful, beautiful Art Deco building. The, the detail was designed by Maxfield Parish, and it's uh, a lot of inlaid tiles and so forth. I mean, this is, you know, this, and it's been recently restored. In fact, a lot of joint ventures, foreign joint ventures, have their offices there now. Um, you know, f uh, this uh, this building, they, 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 the the Cuban government has changed the name of this building. They no longer call it the Edificio Bacardi. It is now the Edificio Emilio Bacardi. So it's like Emilio Bacardi is, I think, widely recognized even by the Cuban government as a genuine Cuban patriot. But, but I think, you know, that, that has to do with Emilio personally, specifically. Uh, and in, um, uh, in Santiago, where more people sort of remember the Bacardi family, and of course there are many, many old people in Santiago who worked for Bacardi, uh, and remember them as being good employers, and remembering a job in the Bacardi Rum Company as being about the best job, best security, the job security you could get uh, in Santiago. I mean, so the Bacardi name in Santiago, I think, still is esteemed to a greater extent than it is in Havana. There is still the, uh, there's the Bacardi Museum uh, in Santiago. There's also the Biblioteca Elvira Cape, 
was, was a, a library founded by Emilio's wife, Elvira Cape, and the Bacardi family plot in Santa Ifigenia, the cemetery, is extremely well maintained. I mean, lovingly maintained. Now, the centerpiece of that plot is the monument to Emilio, but all the Bacardi family members who are buried there, their graves are all very well tended. So I don't know whether there is a distinction between, to some extent there is, between Santiago and Havana. I do think there's a recognition, I think there is a kind of a, to make a long story short, there's a division between the good Bacardis and the bad Bacardis. Great, thanks. Um, was there a question, question up front? Oh, okay, great. Other questions from the floor? Um, right here, yes. Yes, can you glean a... If you can shape, identify yourself. Yeah, I'm sorry, sorry, Yves Savin. Um, what shape will the economic uh, elite uh, take uh, in a post-Castro era? I mean, can we... You mentioned joint ventures. Are there other clues of the sort of... Uh, yeah. Uh, my, my, my feeling about this, and again, this is personal, is that Cuba is in a very different situation than, for example, Poland. Uh, Russia and some of these other Eastern European countries, former socialist countries, I in the sense that they have now had close to 15 years of experience with foreign enterprise, foreign capital, foreign capitalist partners. Uh, joint ventures in Cuba now are very well established, uh, been around for 15 years. Now, the number of joint ventures has actually declined in recent years. Foreign investment has declined in recent years. Nevertheless, I think there is now a whole leadership, which you could call the nomenclatura, of Cuba, uh, who have been raised professionally in a world that is a, a commercial world that is oriented to Western markets. And that very sophisticated about accounting, very sophisticated about marketing, very sophisticated about brands and product placement and all the things that we learn about, you know, sort of in the capitalist world. And again, this is my personal opinion, I think that there is a kind of an excitement among that group about the future, uh, about a sort of a post-socialist future. I mean, I think that there is a readiness to move there and an eagerness even uh, to move there. Um, you know, the in industry that I know the best is the Cuban rum industry, and it's extremely successful. Havana Club Rum, the Cuban-French Havana Club Rum, um, Havana Club Rum is the fastest growing spirit in the world for over a number of years, and it has done very, this is a very successful joint venture. And you know, if Cuba were to move into a capitalist economy, a full market economy, anybody associated with the Havana Club enterprise is going to benefit financially, economically. Uh, and so I think as far as the, the elite is concerned, the, the elite that works in joint ventures, I think that they are very well positioned, and we certainly saw this in Russia and in Poland, where former enterprise managers from the Communist Party, you know, turned into capitalists overnight and were able to convert their positions in the company to equity positions and became extremely wealthy. I mean, how many hundreds of people like that are there in Russia today whose background was in the Communist Party and knew the assets of the, comp of the enterprises they were managing and were able to sort of play around with valuations and so forth and end up with a piece of the equity, I think we're, going to, we're likely to see somebody, something developing like that. I mean, my personal, my personal view is that this transition will be less jarring than a lot of people think precisely because you have this whole business class that has been sort of gradually learning about capitalism over these years. Great. Thank you, Tom. Um, we're going to do just a few more and then uh, allow Tom to uh, sign some books. Okay, sir, right here. Uh, my name is Ed. Can can you address the uh, U.S. <coughs> the U.S. efforts uh, toward sabotaging the Cuban sugar industry with cloud seeding? Thank you. Thank you, sir. No, I can't. As I say, my my book is about the you know what I did investigate very closely is the Bacardi history in Cuba. I didn't. There have been, as I mentioned at the beginning, there have been a number of books written about the history of U.S. interventions in Cuba and the CIA campaign and Operation Mongoose and all, all these um, all these uh, campaigns. That's just not. So, I mean, I mention it in my book because I think it's important to establish the context. But I didn't. I didn't certainly didn't uh, uncover anything new in, the, in that regard. Great, thanks. Uh, and the gentleman in the back. Yeah, uh, Andrew. Thank you. Um, Al Milliken, AM Media. Uh, what more can you say about the Bacardis uh, religiously? <laughs> well, as I said, the, 
Cuba, in general, I think, is probably the least clerical country in Latin America. The Catholic Church in Cuba has never been in a strong position since the end of Spanish rule, because I think, partly because the, the church was seen as an ally of Spain, uh, it really suffered uh, as a result of that. So in general, the, the, the Catholic Church has never been a powerful force politically in Spain like it has been in other Latin countries. Um, uh, Emilio Bacardi in particular, as I said, was very anti-clerical. He, he hated the church in many ways, wrote a lot about the church. And, you know, he, he took a trip to Jerusalem to the Holy Land, you know, in like 1912 and just wrote scathing things there about Christianity and what had happened in the name of Christianity. Now, you know, that's just Emilio. He was kind of an eccentric guy. There were other uh, Bacardi, uh, and in fact, his own daughter, Amalia, Joe Garcia was mentioning his daughter, Amalia Bacardi Cape, who wrote a book about Emilio. She insisted to her dying days that Emilio was more religious than people thought he was, but I'm not convinced of that. And uh, in the current generation of Bacardis, they're, you know, they're religious. They go to church. They go to mass, uh, you know, some of them every day. So maybe this was just uh, Emilio. Uh, I think it was also a product of the time. I just think that... Um, in general, you know, Cubans, uh, particularly Cubans that were politically active during that period, were not, were tended to be not very religious. Okay, great. Tom Jelton, thank you so much for joining us yeah, today. Thank you very much.